This is the SF Productions Podcast Network. May the Schwartz be with you. From the Pop Culture Bunker, I'm Mindy. And I'm Mark. You can check out our audio podcast, How I Got My Wife to Read Comics on iTunes, or on our website, sfpodcastnetwork.com. Well, we've got another Star Wars film coming out soon. Really? Yeah. Disney seems to have soured on the Solo movie and is barely marketing it. Yeah. I, I, I was just thinking that it's interesting that we've been conditioned now to think if a tentpole movie is coming out and we're not getting overwhelming promotion for it, there's something very wrong. Yes. <laughs> well, I think there is. <laughs> so I thought this would be a good time to talk about the original movie and more importantly, what it spawned. Those of you who weren't around in 1977 may not realize what a C, I guess, or, or space, space change, Chapter 4, A New Hope, really was. Because if you look at the box office numbers the year before, so it's 1976, only one movie, Rocky, managed to get past $100 million. With number 10 movie for that year, The Bad News Bears, earned $42 million. Mm-hmm. In fact, only 11 films from 1970 to 76 made over $100 million. A New Hope would go on to make $322 million in its original run. So even if you adjust for inflation, it's number two of all time just be, uh, behind Gone with the Wind. Those kinds of numbers, you really can't ignore them. <laughs> if you're a studio boss, you can't. <laughs> so every slush pile of scripts was dug through for anything even remotely similar to it, and they greenlit those things ASAP. American International Pictures, never shy about exploiting a trend, gave us Star Crash, a space opera complete with a damsel in distress, Carolyn Monroe, a wacky robot, a huge space station that has to be destroyed, an ethereal father figure played by Christopher Plummer, and his swashbuckling son, Played by a young David Hasselhoff. We also get something that looks a lot like a lightsaber. Mm. John Barry supplied a Star Wars-esque soundtrack. The film was riffed in the new season of MST3K. Message from Space is a Japanese space opera. Now, again, there's wacky robots mm -hmm. and a space station slash planet to be blown up. Mm -hmm. United Artists bought the U.S. rights to the movie for a million dollars, thinking it would be, oh, here's... Here's, we can just make money. Just print money with this. Not so Not much. Not so much. Battle Beyond the Stars is essentially the Magnificent Seven in space. Richard Thomas, a.k.a. John Boy, Robert Vaughn, George Papard, John Saxon, Sybil Danning, all-star with music by James Horner and effects by James Cameron. Director Roger Corman turned all of this into a Star Wars knockoff. Saxon is Vader-esque, Thomas is Luke-like, and Vaughn is Hani. Space Raiders is Corman's second attempt at a Star Wars knockoff. This is 1983. Mm -hmm. A space western using footage and music from Battle Beyond the Stars. <laughs> <laughs> so we get another giant space station to be destroyed. Well, at least it's short. It's only 84 minutes. Yeah. The Man Who Saves the World, a.k.a. Turkish Star Wars, is an example of how copyright laws were essentially ignored at the time in much of the world. It's more of a fantasy film than sci-fi, but it actually includes footage from Star Wars, including the Death Star, the Cantina, and X-Wing battles. The main soundtrack theme is the march from Raiders of the Lost Ark. And that reminds me of a video game that was out was circa 84, 85, maybe, that was one of those Laserdisc games, mm -hmm. and it included footage from various <laughs> properties. There was some Battlestar footage, and there was some Star Wars and Star Trek footage. <laughs> it's like, okay, this can't be legal. Star Odyssey is one of four Italian films created quickly in the wake of Star Wars, which involved ragtag bands of humans and robots. There's also The Humanoid from Italy, starring Richard Keel and Barbara Bach. It includes a very familiar text crawl at the start. The bad guy's black costume may remind you of someone, and he companions a triangle-shaped spaceship, you might recall. Oh, and the director, Aldo Leto, was listed as George B. Lewis in the credits. <laughs> space Hunter, Adventures in the Forbidden Zone, Ooh. a Canadian space western, also rode the Star Wars wave. 
film actually has a decent cast. Peter Strauss, Molly Ringwald, Ernie Hudson, Michael Ironside. It was exec produced by Ivan Reitman and was scored by Elmer Bernstein. It was also shot in 3D, which was having a resurgence at that time. Mm -hmm. It was time to come out the week before Return of the Jedi hit the box office. Well, that was bad timing. Well, no, they they wanted people to go, oh, this must be the new movie. Oh. But it only made $16 million at the box office. Yes. Star Chaser, The Legend of Orin is an animated film about a young miner who finds a magic sword with elements from the Star Wars franchise thrown in. The New York Times described the film as such a brazen ripoff of George Lucas's Star Wars that you might think lawyers would have been called in. Its claim to fame is that it was the first full-length animated film in 3D. H.G. Wells' The Shape of Things to Come, a 1979 film, despite the name, has almost nothing to do with the classic book. It's just a way to get people in the theater. Jack Palance, Carol Lindley, and Barry Morse star in this space opera. Again, there's robots and a giant station to be destroyed. If you want to see a version of the actual book, mm -hmm. you may want to try the 1936 Alexander Korda release. Laser Blast, a terrible teen horror flick, actually has two direct Star Wars references. The protagonist, a disaffected teen who found an alien gun, uses it to take out a billboard for the film. Later, a police officer confronted by a scared teen blows him off saying, he's seen Star Wars five times. The film marks proto-nerd Eddie Deason's first film appearance and very late appearances for Roddy McDowell and Keenan Wynn, both of whom should have te be kept better track of their money. And oh, by the way, they misspelled McDowell in the credits. Oh. <laughs> Laser Blast was riffed by MST in the final episode of their comedy Central Run. The War in Space, while using a sound-alike name, is actually a Japanese sci-fi take on a submarine drama. Disney got around to their sci-fi epic, The Black Hole, in 1979. Includes two robots, V-I-N, Sent, Vincent, and B-O-B, -B, Bob, along with human cast Maximilian Schell, Anthony Perkins, Yvette Menu, Ernest Borgnine, Roddy McDowell as Vincent, and Slim Pickens as Bob. It was Disney's first PG-rated film, and was the last mainstream film to include an overture prior to the film itself. Hmm. A remake has been in turnaround for years. Star Trek The Motion Picture, which came out the same month as The Black Hole, was enormously impacted by Star Wars. Plans for a Trek TV movie and series with Shatner and Company, called Star Trek Phase 2, had reached the point where the cast, costume sets, and scripts were ready to go. And then Star Wars hit. The TV series was shut down and film production kicked in. Star Trek The Motion Picture would end up costing $46 million, which included the sunk costs of the drop TV series, as well as money spent on a planned theatrical film prior to that. Some of the Phase 2 scripts would be reworked into Next Generation episodes a decade later. Think of the bunglers in the War of the Planets as a Three Stooges Star Wars parody, except they're Brazilians mm -hmm. and there are four of them. A better parody would be Spaceballs, the Mel Brooks epic, which introduced the Schwartz, and characters Princess Vespa of Duridia, funny she doesn't look druish, Dark Helmet, Lone Star with sidekick Barf, along with Wizen Stage Yogurt, played by Brooks, Robot Dot Matrix, and disgusting alien Pizza the Hut. There's even a reference to the real power in the universe, merchandising. Brooks got George Lucas to allow the parody as long as they didn't make action figures. Because Lucas said, your action figures are going to look like mine. <laughs> the film might have been a bigger hit and it had not come out ten years after the original. Yeah. TV cashed in on the trend as well. Battlestar Galactica, a space epic about a refugee ship searching for a lost colony called Earth, was a project that producer Glenn A. Larson had been trying to sell for years. And then Star Wars hit. The show, which was originally intended to be a series of TV movies, was extremely expensive and so only lasted 24 episodes. It was then rebooted into Galactica 1980, which was based on Earth and was extremely cheap. It lasted all of 10 episodes. Of course, the show was rebooted again in the 2000s as a serious sci-fi drama running for four seasons with TV movies and various spin-offs. Space Academy falls on the other end of the expense scale, a Saturday morning live action series from Filmation in the 70s. 
Jonathan Harris, Lost in Space's Dr. Smith, runs a space exploration school with students including TV child actor mainstay Pamela Ferdin. Like all children's TV of the time, the show was all about teaching lessons. There was even a spinoff called Jason of Star Command featuring Star Trek's James Doohan, which used the same sets and costumes as the other series. Wow, is there one of those on YouTube? Oh, I, oh yeah, there are. I think yeah. I might like to see that. Yeah. You might consider the cult TV parody Quark to be a Star Wars knockoff, but the pilot actually came out just before the movie. The series, though, probably got a green light because of it. Richard Benjamin starred as the captain of a garbage ship, which happens to get into galactic crises. In reality, it was more of a Star Trek parody, with some references to Lost in Space, Buck Rogers, and Flash Gordon. Meanwhile, many existing TV series added sci-fi elements. In fact, you can even argue that Mork and Mindy is Gary Marshall's response to Star Wars. Really? Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> I can see that. Also, we should note that merchandising was forever changed mm -hmm. by Star Wars. Now, movies rarely got much of a merchandising push before that movie, mainly because there was a long lead period for creating toys and other non-paper products like posters. Since no one knew for a fact that a film would be a hit months in advance, it made little sense to invest in making such things. Right. So you'd get the most junior lawyer at a studio would be tasked to eke out whatever they could make. Mm -hmm. TV was where it was in terms of merchandising, mm -hmm. since the hit, hit show would run a year or more, giving you lead time for toys, etc. And Star Wars changed all that. Tentpole releases now get a bevy of toys, games, food, bedsheets, toothbrushes, radio tires, whatever it is. The Star Wars franchise still lords over them all. Kenner, and then Hasbro, has sold almost 9 billion action figures... $2.8 billion in books, and $5.7 billion in video games. Merchandising has far outweighed the actual return from the movie itself. Absolutely. Hmm, maybe we should make action figures of ourselves to sell. Merchandise, SF <laughs> Podcast Network. Mm. I don't think that's going to happen, but while you're waiting, you can check out our audio podcast, How I Got My Wife to Read Comics on iTunes, or on our website, sfpodcastnetwork.com. From the Pop Culture Bunker, I'm Mindy. And I'm Mark. Thanks for watching.